I want to uh, remind everyone here that the SI schedule is right here, right in front of your nose every day for at least a few minutes. <clears throat> they had uh, SI last night, yesterday afternoon, and uh, we had a little bit of a snafu with uh, homework for Shy, but we'll get that straightened out. You'll have a little bit of homework tonight. Not too much. That's the other good news. Small homework. Uh, but Tuesday afternoon, 4.30, that's today. Yeah, classroom building one across the way up on the third floor. SI, yeah. Dude, this thing is burnt. It's... I'm having one of those days again. Uh, dear, you want it? Can you hit the lights? All right, I'll, I'll try not to breathe on my computer. Uh, sorry for that interruption. Uh, anyway, uh, try to get down to SI uh, this afternoon. Uh, and it'll help. First thing we're going to do today is to reinforce the calculation in uh, homework five, the brain burner at the very end, uh, where you got some guy climbing up a cliff. And in, in addition to his climbing gear, he's got a baseball because he's a physics nerd, I guess. And so he decides to do a physics experiment. Can you, and you know, I'm not, I'm not really, uh, exaggerating guys that do this are slightly crazy in the first place to do that and they they'll do all they'll bring all kind of stuff with them i mean you know just for fun i don't know if i would do it but that's what they i mean they do stuff like that so you're hanging on a ledge on a tall cliff and you're 33 meters above the starting point so that's like that's like this guy down here there's your starting point okay and you toss a ball so that you're up here 33 meters up from that and you toss a ball straight upward now if you look at that cliff it's pretty he's got a you know down below the starting point down here you still got a long ways to go before you hit terra firma so um but for 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 one thing you can say your initial position is 33 meters, 33.0 meters up uh, on the uh, vertical scale. And we'll assume that that's the x-axis there, the origin of the x-axis, although that doesn't enter into this calculation. So it's not a great big worry. Um, now, your objective, this is a quote from the problem in web courses. Predict the coordinate y subscript f at time t equals 1.4 seconds after starting with baseball initial conditions, 33.0 uh, meters for the initial position, and in this particular instance, two meters per second for the upward uh, initial speed, VIY. Now, I put a, a red box around t equals 1.4 seconds to indicate to you that is one of the part of this one of the parts of this problem that changes for each attempt. The other part is this one. And I design these problems. So I design, you know, I can have one variable or, you know, four or five, I guess, if I want. I hardly ever go beyond two or three. This one's got two. So you'll have different values of initial upward velocity, VIY, and uh, the time that you take an interest in the position uh, of the baseball. So this instance it's 1.4. So we want to use this equation and that was in the problem and it was also in at the top in the instructions for the entire homework. Uh, and in this equation you want to use a negative sign if you have anything that's a downward or below if it's a position if your position is below zero that means you're below that starting point. Okay, uh, so we're going to use the minus sign for that. 
uh, there were some students uh, in discussions last night saying, uh, Dr. B, I was trying to use t equals zero uh, in my calculation. Uh, no, you don't use t equals zero in this equation simply because um, that's ancient history. This equation gives you the present state of position or the present value of the position at time t equals 1.4 seconds. So wherever you see a t in there, that's where your value 1.4 goes. And over here, in this part of the equation, this part of the formula, you actually square it before you go any further. Okay, so we'll do that together. Let's go to the next screen. Okay, your first move is to just plug in the values that you have got. And, oh, oh I got a problem here. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. All right, my upward initial velocity was uh, 2.0 meters per second. So that goes right in there. All right, and my 33 is out here. That you just copy in. You, you don't really have to do any calculations with that until you're ready to add everything up at the very end. All right, then my, my value for G is right here, and that's negatory. Right now, I put it in parentheses, um, and when I'm doing problems with you, either on the document cam or here on the uh, the uh, keynote file, I'll try to use parentheses. But you do whatever you think is is good. All right. And all right. Now, where does the time come in? Well, the time comes in here and over here, and this one over on the right side, this little blue underscore, uh, indicates that it's in that square bracket, and we're going to square everything inside that bracket, okay? But if you're taking steps, and, you know, some of you guys that have had calc or trig class, this may be, or physics class in high school, this you may be thinking, come on, Dr. B, this is baby steps. But for a lot of students in here, it's good to go through step by step. Okay, and that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, just go so everybody knows exactly how to do this. All right, so next, you calculate these two baby. Well, you can calculate these two babies next, and you get 2.80 meters. Two seconds, or excuse me, two meters per second. 1.4 seconds, 2.8 meters. Ding! You just multiply those two together. All right, now over here, um, this 1.4, um, is computes out to 1.96 seconds squared. And notice that my square is inside the square brackets now. It was outside up here, but it's inside here. Now, uh, the other intermediate step is uh, 1 half g. And that gives me a negative 4.9. Okay, and notice that uh, I haven't canceled a second squared top and bottom here, but you can. And if you're writing this down, you can definitely uh, put a little line slashing through second squared here in the square brackets and second squared here in the denominator of that middle uh, regular parentheses. All right, so that's an intermediate step. And if you're skilled on your calculator, you can do all this stuff, you know, without too much fuss and muss. But if you're doing it on paper, you know, if you're a little nervous, just do it on paper, step by step, and then you can check your work and stuff. All right, so now negative 4.9 times 1.96 uh, works out to negative 9.604. And 33 plus 2.8 is 35.8 meters. Now, we're, we have three significant figures here. So even though this one is two decimal points, three significant figures, 2.80, um, down here, when I combine them, it only leaves me with one uh, decimal point, 
a tenth place because I have two significant figures out in front to the left of the decimal point. All right, so we sacrifice, sacrifice this one here, and then something similar happens with this. When you add these two together, and notice I'm adding a negative. That's the same as subtracting. All right, if you remember from uh, high school math class, addition of a negative is the same as subtraction. All right, and that's what I've got here. 35.8 minus 9.06, or excuse me, 9.604 um, uh, gives me a 26.2 meters, which is the correct answer. Now, uh, something I didn't mention to you, I, I don't think, maybe I did, but I'll re-mention it to you. When you type in a number uh, in the numerical answer calculation questions, it appears to add a bunch of zeros so that you have four decimal points expressed. It does that whether you type it or not. I don't like it. It's not necessary. If you type in the, the amount of decimal points that I specify, it will, and if it's correct, it, you know, it'll be graded uh, correctly. Now, if you type in the, the number of decimal points that I specify and you make a mistake, you know, like on this one, 26.3, uh, then, you know, you're still going to be wrong. But don't worry about those extra zeros. They pad it with zeros like that. I don't know why. It's, it's kind of bogus, in my opinion. But unfortunately, it's not something I can control. It's Canvas's way or the highway. Now let me uh, pause for questions. Yes. The question was, when I did the 9.8 as negative, when would it be positive? The answer is, when you're doing something simple like a drop distance calculation, and that's a distance from a point up here to a point down below you know your drop distance that's just one half times 9.8 times t squared but when you're doing something that has a pos uh, it's a position or a velocity that has a direction left or right up and down um, then you've got to put it in as a negative you know and some people will will write it as one as minus one half gt squared but i like to put it in the, keep it in the g you know, one half, and then a quantity negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So to re to uh, recap, you use the negatives when you care about a position in above and below, uh, or if you care about velocities upward or downward. It, which we don't, we're not working on velocities here, uh, but we are working on positions. And this one, he's still above the starting point. It's below his, this is 26.02. So this is somewhere but be, be, seven meters below where he is, approximately. Okay. So his partner down below at the starting point looks up and sees it. He looks down and sees it. All right, another question. Yes. The question is, how similar are the tests to these questions? Yes. I'm not going to tell you what's on the test. But I will say, if you can handle this particular problem, this brain burner, you'll be a little bit happier than otherwise on test day. That's next Thursday. We've got a lot of stuff to cover. Now, to, to help you see and improve your confidence in this brain burner, let's try another one. All right. So get your calculator out. And we're on frequency BB, bravo, bravo. And get your calculator out because it's the same... We're going up the same cliff. And it's going to be a numeric answer. And 
depending on what I give you, you might need a negative sign. Uh, so make sure you know where your negative sign is. It's in there when you're in numeric mode. Okay, so get your get your go nitro and then ready. And get your calculator out and also write down the specs. And you'll have this for a study problem to review with your, your friends. Okay, same cliff. Initial position, 33.0 meters. However, it's your climbing partner now. He's there and he tosses it a little differently. A little bit slower. 0 0.65 meters per second. All right, now let me start the problem. Okay, you can start on the problem and you can answer it whenever you feel like it. Take your time. And definitely uh, consult with your next door neighbor and kind of coordinate. And that'll help. And I will drink a little coffee. It's in. It's down below. I think it's below the. Where's the. Where's the minus sign? Is it above the numbers or below? It's above, the numbers. It's above, zero. above zero and below the numbers. Okay. I don't know. I, I, actually, I have one. Do you have yours? You still have yours?
Raise your hand if, you're, if you've clicked in your answer. Okay, the rest of you keep going. Get your answer in. Never trust in Adam. They make up everything. They're always full of stories. They make up everything. That's no good. One minute. Thirty seconds. For the exam, can you bring in a graphing calculator? Formulas? Ask me that after this question. It's a good question. And Well, let's do this and then I'll explain that. Five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Oh my goodness. We got hold on. We got a bunch of geniuses in here to because the answer is negative twenty four point seven five. Now, a couple of you guys blew it. <laughs> Negative 24.8. But only a couple of you. Uh, and it looks like some of you. Oh, man. Positive 20. That means you missed your negative sign. Uh, make sure you go back and... and uh, find your negative sign because you might need it on the exam uh, now a student uh, did you did you have a question somebody had a question over here no not I know you have a question somebody else no some somebody else saw the answer and then put their hand up okay uh, now a student was asking me, hey Dr. B, how do we handle formulas? You might want to jot this down for your notes. How do we handle formulas on the test? Do we have a formula page? And the answer to that is no. Uh, but here's what I do. You don't really have a formula page, you know, like on the front, you know, the formula page. But what I do is I set up a big set of I figure out what formulas you're going to need and then I, f I make a matching section you know three or four questions four or five questions five or six questions and each matching item you know you you like it'll be like number one and then you have option a b c d and e and then option two uh, question two the same options a b c d and you gotta you know match them and stuff so what I do is I, I have a set of like number one through three will be three definitions, you know, with words. And then options A, B, C, D, and E might be equations or formulas or something. Or I might do it the other way around. You know, number one is the formula, and number two is another formula, number three is another, and then A, B, C, and D and there are definitions or, or some kind of concept or you know the name of the formula or something like that 
Okay, so I might have, you know, number three, one half GT squared, and then option D would be drop distance formula, okay, or free fall distance formula or something like that. Okay, so, and I do that for all the equations that you're going to need. And it's, so it's really free money if you can recognize the formula. So that's a little bit different task than memorizing. And in general, I, I, I have mentioned this, memorizing in this class in general is not going to help you a whole lot. So if you're used to classes where legitimately it is a good strategy to st study, to memorize with uh, flashcards and stuff, in this class, not so much. Okay, because, and, and to c totally uh, deflate that, um, I, I put the matching formula section at the beginning of every test. So the final is going to have maybe 10 matching, you know, depending on what you need for the final, because that's twice as big. But usually it's, I don't know, up to five or six questions maximum for matching. And then I have some true and false. Oh, and the, the other thing is, if I don't put it in matching, I might put it directly in um, the question. So, for instance, I believe in homework number five, I said you use this formula, yf equals yi plus et cetera, et cetera. I gave you that formula in homework five. And in exams, sometimes I'll embed the formula in the question itself so you won't even have to guess about it. You know, and I sometimes I do that because I'm writing the test. So I, I usually don't write the test until the night before. And then I make photocopies the night before or the day of the test. And it's pretty high stress when I do that. That's why I have such great TAs to help with that. But um, it's I, I'm always, you know, writing new test problems and stuff like that. And, which takes time and stuff, and occasionally I'll forget to put one in matching, and so I decide, okay, I better write that into a question somewhere. So that's how I, I, I sometimes do it. But usually it's matching. All right? Is that a good answer? Good. Now, I want to talk about acceleration. Last time, we had those big blobs of text which were embedded in the uh, video of the lecture and just to hit the high points they were about Galileo's idea or his his mental uh, state that you know he was going to try to study accelerated motion and uh, let me get that out of the way there. Okay. He was going to try to study accelerated motion. He, and he said, f first of all, it's got to fit nature. It's got to be something that we see in nature. And he, he made this conjecture that he's going to use free fall of all the different accelerations. You know, everybody's ac accelerating all the time. If you're if you're a, a horse pulling a wagon and you're up on the wagon, you go from zero to, you know, five miles an hour uh, in a given amount of time. Less if you have a strong horse. More time if you have a weaker horse. Uh, but of all the accelerations in nature, he chose free fall. And he was able to say that he, his claims... Um, were verified by experiments. So he, he was doing experiments and to and he found that his claims were accurate because experiments verified what he said was happening. And he did it all. He you know, he emphasized, as I've emphasized many times, in the great book of nature, that the language of nature is mathematical and that nature expresses herself herself in triangles and circles and, and other um, mathematical utterances uh, that we you know that we then try to figure out 
he said that in free fall and in an acceleration in general, the object that's accelerating is continually acquiring new increments of speed. And I would add that it might be acquiring new negative increments of speed. In other words, it could be slowing down. All right. But he, you know, he he was talking, you know, in his in his dialogue, he was talking about something on the way down in free fall, straight down. And so in free fall, yes, it is continually acquiring new increments of speed. And free fall in itself is a constant acceleration. All right. Now, if you're a linebacker, if you're a race car driver, if you're on your bicycle, you have variable accelerations as you go around campus or as you go around the football field, from the huddle to the line of scrimmage, then the snap, then you take off flying, you know, and then you get tackled, you decelerate, or you block and you decelerate somebody else's butt, you know. And those are variable accelerations, but free fall, it's always the same. Continually adding new increments, new increments of speed and repeating yourself always in the same manner. Now, that was th those are some of the uh, key insights of Galileo going into his thing. Now, here is, here's a picture of, this is a parabolic arc. I did it on graph paper, excuse me, on a graphing uh, program. And it's also in your textbook. This is like the trajectory uh, of a baseball as it goes to the outfield and you know it goes up and then it comes down after it hits its maximum height you know its maximum height is way up here at the top of the image and then over here on the right side this is the outfield it's it's uh, you know it's being caught now Galileo was very interested in that the reason was many people were interested in what projectiles do you know, they go, you know, they don't, everybody knew they don't go straight. You know, they go, they follow a curve, but nobody had a, a good solid proof that it was one shape or another until Galileo figured it out. And the reason that you want to know what shape it is, is that if you figure it out, the, the exact shape, the exact formula for the shape, you can um, predict where your cannonball is going to go. So if you want your cannonball to land on a British warship, you know, from, from Napoleon's Navy, you know, you're shooting at British warships, and you don't want to bomb Napoleon's ship, you know, you want to be able to place it where you want it. And so this is a valuable thing for those cats to know. We still use it today. You know, this and, and all other gravitational trajectories. I mean, the Air Force and NASA, I mean, this is this is child's play for the for the Army. You know, they could a good artillery man could put a round easily put a round of artillery into this corner of the room up here from several miles away using this trajectory and a little bit of aerodynamics. And if he doesn't use aerodynamics, he could put it easily from four or five miles away. He could put it easily into this classroom. All right. So they, you know, they, the army knows this stuff out the wazoo. Now, here's what Galileo was, you know, he's trying to figure out what projectiles do. So let's make a sketch of a Ferrari driving off the edge of a cliff. Okay. So think of a tall cliff, perfectly flat on top. And its top surface can be our x-axis. And then it and then you know the cliff drops off, and that could be our y-axis, our negative y-axis. Alright. So Galileo said, alright, a projectile is gonna be like like this Ferrari. It drives along at a constant speed. You know, so for instance, 20 meters per second or whatever speed you've got going in your Ferrari, right? And if it were a frictionless plane and you had an ideal Ferrari, 
you could turn the engine off. And on a friction with a frictionless Ferrari on a frictionless plane, you could turn the engine off and just let it coast, and it would stay at 20 meters per second. All right. So Galileo is saying, all right, I think in in this particular case that it will stay in this state of motion horizontally if there's no force acting on it. But then when it keeps going past the edge of the cliff, that's when all you know what breaks loose. All right, so you start your clock, and at the same time you start to drop. Now if you're in a Ferrari, hopefully you have ejection seats. But, or you have a, a good landing pad at the bottom. You know, like in Hollywood, they drive stuff off cliffs all the time, but it's always because they don't show where at the, you know, where the thing falls, you know, it when they're doing the stunt, you know, that there's all kinds of equipment to catch everybody. Uh, or they do it all CGI, but anyways, Galileo didn't have that. So here's what Galileo said. It that this Ferrari going over the edge of the cliff at constant speed would then start to acquire some downward free fall, but keep everything it already had. He said it's going to keep going at a constant speed horizontally. So it's going to have the same horizontal component. So draw a couple horizontal arrows to represent the and make them the same length like these three. Now, if that Ferrari was still on top of the cliff, those arrows could represent its velocity. All right, and Galileo said it's going to keep all of those because there's no horizontal gravity. The only gravity is vertical. So he said it's going to get, it's going to acquire some of these downward babies. You know, they're transcripting my podcast. I use a lot of slang. These aren't babies. They're arrows. He's, he, uh, so Galileo is saying it's going to keep all your constant horizontal velocity component, those three across the top, equal length. But notice it's going to start acquiring bigger and bigger downward velocity components. All right, And he said, this is what nature does. Nature combines the horizontal constant velocity with a freefall velocity. And he said, when you do that, you get a parabolic arc. And so he said, this is half of what A projectile launched from a cannon. So this this picture here, that's two halves, two symmetric halves of this one uh, on the Ferrari slide. It combines the horizontal. It keeps all the horizontal, and it acquires this downward set of velocity vectors they and they keep getting bigger and bigger as it goes downward all right so when you go off the top of the cliff right up here at the instant you leave the cliff for that instant only you're going straight horizontally but once you've passed the top of the cliff your your velocity starts tilting downward because you get some free fall velocity so you keep that 20 meters per second sideways, and now for every second of free fall, you've got 9.8 meters per second downward. At time t equals 2 seconds, after you pass the cliff, you've got 19.6 meters per second downward. 3 seconds, 29.4 meters per second downward, etc., etc. Now, the reason that he could make that strategic conjecture was because he had done some experiments. So let's talk about his conjecture. The, the weird thing was that he 
he's putting, he says, nature allows both of those two states of motion to exist together if there's no force. So if there's no force horizontally, there's no change in the horizontal speed. And Aristotle would have said, get out of town. Except he would have said, get out of Athens. But Galileo knew, yeah, this is kosher. It's not, you know, and he said, you, you know, Aristotle, I love you. You're a brother. You're a good guy. Okay, you're from Greece. You're not Italian, but. But my brother, I I know this is kosher because uh, I've done my experiments on inclined planes. And the key concept that Galileo f observed was the case was, was this one. How much of gra you know when you're when when you're on a on a, a ramp like the aisle here, it's a very shallow tilt angle, very small tilt angle, you're not falling at nine point eight meters per second squared as you go down the aisle. It's much less. Um, so how much does it depend, you know, what does it depend on? If it's less, how does it vary? Well, it depends on the tilt angle alpha in this diagram. Okay, so here's your, here's your straight down acceleration, W, for the weight force. You know, if everything that has weight on the surface of Earth is going to have 9.8 meters per second squared, of downward acceleration so that's a big arrow there but if you're up here on this ramp um, you're not accelerating downward you're just you're, you're accelerating but nowhere near 9.8 so the, the way that you have to figure it out is by using trigonometry and basically let me go back to that screen sorry I, th I thought I So the, the amount of acceleration, you know, down tilting down the ramp, uh, is it depends on trig and and we're going to do a little bit of right triangles and similar triangles here right now, on the next screen. But what I, I'll I'll just ask you to add into your notes if angle alpha is 90 degrees you know instead of instead of here you know like at about 10 degrees if it's 90 straight up then you have all of that 9.8 meters per second squared but as your ramp gets tiltier and tiltier closer and closer to horizontal you're not getting as much you know, so if it was 45 degrees, that would be a pretty good acceleration. And raise your hand if you've ever been skiing. Wow, that's a good number. If you're on a mountain, and you may say to yourself, yeah, 45 degrees, no problem. Yeah, you go up on the mountain and try sliding down a 45-degree angle. You're going to lose your lunch as soon as you look down the run. That's really steep. And you start going fast in a heartbeat. But something like this, even something like that would get you, this this little angle here, alpha, in the movie, in the podcast, uh, that would get you going pretty fast as well. Anyways, let's take a look at what we got. The key thing is we want to figure out, okay, he doesn't get 9.8. How much does he get? Well, we're going to look at this diagram. And this is a diagram from your textbook. Now, some of the acceleration is actually absorbed by the ramp if the ramp is rigid. Okay, so this, you know, our floor is, is rigid. So, you know, 9.8, if, if the ramp were not um, at, you know, you know, 5 or 10 degrees here, is, which is what we got, um, if it were 90 degrees, the ramp wouldn't even enter it. I mean, you'd just be falling alongside the ramp. It's a cliff. It's not a ramp. It's a cliff. But as soon as you start sitting on the ramp at some angle, 
The, the ramp itself is going to absorb some of the force of gravity. But some of it's not going to be absorbed, and that's what we're going to figure out. So here's how you do it. You take your angle, your physical ramp, and you make a copy of that, and you make the, the, the hypotenuse of that one the same length as your acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared. All right? And then you take, so you have these two similar triangles. So write down two similar triangles. This one up here is your physical triangle that you can see and measure with meter sticks and protractor and whatnot. And then this one's kind of abstract. But make it the same shape. So if you can see your ramp, you could figure out a similar triangle, and then we'll just call this yellow triangle, the hypotenuse, um, W, 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, if you then rotate it so that the short side of the yellow triangle is parallel to the slope of the ramp, Okay, so, you know, make a copy. Um, in this orientation, the short side of this triangle, now it's the same shape. They're proportional triangles. They're different sizes. They're, they're not even, you know, one of them is physical, measured with meters and inches. And this one's measured with acceleration. So it's an acceleration triangle. But shape-wise, they're the same. So if you rotate it so that the short side of the accelerations triangle is parallel to the uh, ramp itself, okay, the hypotenuse of the ramp, um, then this short side will represent the amount of acceleration due to gravity that you get along the ramp. The ramp rigidity... This arrow A is the long side of the yellow triangle, all right? And that arrow is labeled A for absorbed. It's absorbed by the rigidity. So the rigidity prevents any of that acceleration from happening to you, all right? But if you've got some tilt, it doesn't absorb all of it, all right? So you still get a little bit, and that's this little teeny arrow D for downhill, down the ramp, all right? And so you can read about this uh, in the textbook. Now, I want to go to the document cam for just a minute, and I want to um, go over with you a couple of things that Galileo used based on that ramp result. So, here's what Galileo was talking about. He said, look, if something's on a flat plane like this, the ball's going to be indifferent to slowing down or speeding up. It doesn't, if, it, if this is flat, it doesn't need any force to keep it going. It'll just keep whatever speed it is, or if it's at rest, it'll stay at rest. So if it's, if it's going left at 4 meters per second, he said, you'll just keep cruising along. The reason he did that is because he knew his ramps. Okay, now, the counterclaim is this one. So let's say that you say, get out of town, Galileo. Go back to Bulgaria. You know, you... You definitely, this is Aristotle talking, by the way. You definitely need a small push force of some kind to keep it going at that speed. That's what Aristotle's position was. And that was the position of many, many people in academia at the time of Galileo. So about the time of Shakespeare, late 1500s, early 1600s is when all this debate was going on. You know, some people are saying, nope. If you're going along at a constant speed on a flat, you got to have a little bit of force. All right, so I've got a plane here, and I've got a little bit of force. And here's what Galileo said. 
I don't care what size force you have here, okay, I, c I can make a triangle that proves you don't need it. Here's how we did it. So here's a, let me try to copy that force. Uh, dude, I can't copy it. Um, hold on a second. Let me try something here. Hold on. I'm going to rip a page out of my notebook and copy this arrow. Can you guys see that? Okay, here it is. I can see it. Okay, so that's a copy. Okay, so there's a copy, that arrow there. And Galileo said, no matter what size you think that force is, there's going to be a ramp for which that is the downhill uh, part of the ramp motion, D. So here's what he's saying. I don't care what push force you use, P, this is P, I can always build a ramp of this exact shape, okay, with this push here and this, ex you know, and this, you know, I'll just put W here for the weight force. And he could figure out this angle, I'll call it theta. Galileo says, I can build this. I can build this ramp. So if you say that P, for instance, if uh, P is uh, 0 0.002 uh, units of force, metric units, a force he can build a ramp with this being the total weight force um, uh, of this shape so this is um, a ramp this he can build a ramp from this from this shape and because that is true he can say that on this ramp D, the downhill part of your acceleration on this ramp, uh, is what pushes it down the ramp. Similarly, if you were to hold it, if you were to provide an uphill force U, you could keep it stabilized on the ramp right, and keep it from rolling down. So Galileo said, look, if, if this is the push force that keeps something up on a ramp, then you are wrong here. This is wrong. If you say that it's required on a flat plane, I can build a ramp that says, no, that's what you need on this inclined plane. You don't need this much. Galileo is saying, no matter what size force you propose is needed to keep something going horizontally, I can show that, no, that amount of force is what you need on a ramp, not on a flat plane. Flat planes don't need a force. And so there's your, there's your lesson for, the, for today. A flat plane, because of this ramp a concept, a flat plane does not need any force to keep something going at a constant speed. A ramp does. You know, a ramp has to, you know, but not a flat plane. Flat planes, no matter how small the push force you say it needs, Galileo said, I can defeat that. And, and of course, Galileo won. He won the argument. Now, um, 
All of this is described in chapter 2 and the beginnings of chapter 3. So your homework tonight, let me go back to the movie. Um, your homework is going to be fairly short, homework 6. And, but I definitely want you to really read carefully into chapters 2, all of chapter 2 and into chapter 3. We'll talk about chapter 3 on Thursday. Okay, you're dismissed a little bit early today.